Hello, thank you for listening to QCare Surgery Nerves. Uh, we're going to discuss how to manage giant duodenal ulcer perforations. I'm going to review the paper, Duodenal Ulcer Perforations, a Systematic Literature Review and Narrative Description of Surgical Techniques Used to Treat Large Duodenal Defects. This was published in the Journal of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery Online in July 2021. This is also included on their website under one of the top 21 articles of 2021. Giant ulcers are surgical challenges due to the complexity of pathology and the rarity due to the use of PPIs, H2 blockers, and H. pylori treatment. Giant has been defined in previous papers as either greater than 2 cm or greater than 3 cm depending on the author. For this paper, the authors state that these are ulcers that are of any perforation that cannot be managed by conventional methods because of the size and extent of tissue loss, conventional methods being suture closure or mental patch repair. So these are the questions that the authors attempted to address. How to best close, repair, or resect the perforated duodenum? Diversion of gastric or duodenal contents away from the repair is necessary and how this could be achieved. How and when to reconstruct GI continuity and considerations for access central feeding distally to the perforation in these complex patients. The authors reviewed papers from 1970 to 2020 and looked for papers regarding surgical technique and giant ulcers. They ultimately resulted in 25 studies that were reviewed. Here's a list of the studies. And here's the rest of the list. The mental plug is the first technique reviewed and first mentioned by Karangia in 1993. Here's a PC article with the picture. It involves tying the end of the omentum, not a pedicle, to a nasogastric tube with cat gut, pulling the nasogastric tube back, and then suturing the edges of the omentum to the edges of the ulcer. This helps secure the omentum into the defect. The nasogastric tube is removed in one week, presumably when the absorbable stitch has dissolved. Outcomes of the plug versus omentopexy has been evaluated. Of 100 patients, the plug had lower short and long-term morbidities and lower postoperative leak. There is also no difference in mortality. Other papers noted fewer rates of duodenal fistula in the plug group. One paper noted increase in postoperative hemorrhage in the plug group. To combat this, one author created the free omental plug, which has created a mushroom shape with the omentum with two sutures tied around a stalk of omentum and pushing it into the defect and tying it into place, as you can see here in the picture. The benefit of the plug is that it's simple, quick, and accessible and doesn't involve division of the GI continuity. The next technique is the triple tube technique. It involves cocorization of the duodenum, excision of the ulcer margins, and primary closure of the duodenal perforation. Subsequently, three tubes are placed. First, an anti-mesenteric enterotomy is placed in the jejunum, approximately 15 centimeters distal to the duodenal jejunal flexure, and a retrograde duodenostomy tube is placed, allowing decompression of the duodenum and takes the tension off the primary repair. A second tube, an anti-grade jejunostomy, for feeding purposes is passed uh, via second enterotomy, five centimeters distal to the first. Finally, a gastrotomy tube is placed to the reduce the secretion load passing into the duodenum. This technique does not require restoration of GI continuity at a, larger, at a later stage. In a non-randomized case control study of 40 patients by Lal et al., those who underwent conventional omentopexy had 65% mortality at 30 days, all attributed to least compared to 5% mortality in a study group of the triple tube technique where there were no leaks. There have been several modifications to this technique, such as entrectomy with G tube, a duodenostomy and J tube, or pyloric exclusion. Duodenostomy tube and J tube, so not basically the triple tube technique, but a similar idea. The image on the left is provided by the paper, which talks about a biliary tube in this in this photo, a retrograde duodenostomy tube and a J tube. I provide on the right side of the screen what appears to be emphasized in the paper. The triple tube technique can be quick and simple, yet it relies on a defect able to be closed. Next is the gastric body partition. There are two case series on gastric body partition. This involves closing of the perforation followed by a partition of the gastric body with a linear stapler 
two centimeters proximal to the angular insura. To restore GI continuity, a gastric agenostomy is performed, and a duodenostomy tube was inserted for biliary drainage. The authors stress that dividing the stomach and the gastric body as opposed to the antrum will avoid the occurrence of hypergastrinemia. They report a 5.6% mortality in minor leaks and 38.9% of patients, all managed conservatively. This technique means that the ulcer must be closed and diversion of GI contents is permanent and further a gastric agenostomy must be created, so this may be more of a technical procedure. The next technique is duodenogagenostomy. In this technique, the perforated the perforation site is identified and extended into the pylorus to minimize risk of subsequent gastric outlet obstruction. Subsequently, a loop of jejunum is brought up in a retrocolic fashion and a hand-sewn side-to-side duodenogagenostomy is performed. The main appeal of this technique is it's relatively sim simple and in theory uses only a single anastomosis. The next technique is serosal patches. This involves bringing a loop of jejunum approximately 40 to 60 centimeters distal to, to the ligament rights over the colon and using this to close the perforation site serosa to serosa. A case series by Chaudhry et al. on eight patients with large duodenal ulcer perforations, five of whom were treated with duodenal serosal patches, cites a total 30 day mortality of three in the eight patients, which is 37.5% and a 4 in 8 or 50% incidence of intra-abdominal abscess requiring reoperation. The authors state that serosal patching may produce duodenal stenosis or obstruction if used for larger defects, and its use is only recommended if half to two-thirds of the duodenal wall remains intact. Next, the authors talk about pedicled grafts. They talk about carrying out resection of a short segment of jejunum, including its mesentery, approximately 20 centimeters distal to the ligament atrides. This pedicle graft was brought through its transverse mesocolon, open longitudinally along the anti-mesenteric border, and trimmed to cover the duodenal defect prior to an anastomosis. This technique required a distal end-to-end -end jejunostomy at the site from which the graft was taken. And additionally, the authors completed a gastrogenostomy to partially bypass the duodenum. This technique sounds complex, requires several anastomoses, and are very few case reports describing its outcomes. Next, they discuss pancreas preserving duodenal resection. For injuries to D1, D2 proximal to the ampulla vitae, this technique involves cocorization of the duodenum, cholecystectomy, and placing a transcystic a tube down the column bowel duct and into the duodenum to allow anatomic correlation of the perforation to the location of the ampulla. A distal gastrectomy is carried out, uh, which allows flipping of the specimen and dissection of the proximal duodenum off the pancreas. An endostapler is used uh, tangentially across healthy duodenum proximal to the ampulla. You can see it here in the pictures. In terms of intraoperative outcomes, the authors report a mean operative time of 4 hours with one resection undertaken laparoscopically. Mean hospital stay was 17.8 days. And this technique had a 20% or 2 in 10 patient mortality with a 90% morbidity. Continuity was restored with a real and wide gastrogenostomy. The external biliary drainage is achieved with a transcystic tube. The advantage of these techniques include resection of the damaged segment of duodenum with the preservation of normal flow of bile into the remaining duodenum. Resection as opposed to a simple closure of the duodenal defect has been associated with reduction in ulcer recurrence in five years. While complex compared with the previous techniques described, they allow for definitive management and may be used in extensive injuries, otherwise requiring pancreatic duodenectomy, a procedure that should be avoided in an emergency setting at all costs. The last technique of discussion in this paper, the gastric resection, followed by a B1, B2 reconstruction. These are the images of the ACS textbook from 2014. Chin et al. noted a mortality of 20.7%, with 10 of 58 patients, or 17.2%, suffering from postoperative intra-abdominal collections. 
8 out of 58 patients, or 13.8%, found to have a leak, and 4 out of 58, or 6.9%, requiring reoperation in their study of 58 patients. Kujoth et al. reports a case series of 29 patients, the majority of which underwent a B2 reconstruction for a complicated duodenal ulcer perforation and cites a similar mortality rate of 17.2%, or 5 out of 29 patients, but only one patient, uh, 3.4%, is suffering from a leak. Most research is case studies and case series, uh, and there's likely a selection bias in these papers. The authors suggest approaching the problem down uh, into four distinct steps which require consideration. First is the question of how to best close, repair, or resect the perforator or damaged duodenum. Second is whether diversion of gastric and duodenal contents away from the repair is necessary and how this could best be achieved. Third, how and when to reconstruct gastrointestinal continuity if this has been disrupted. And finally, consideration of access to enteral feeding distally to the perforation in these complex patients. The authors created the above table to help categorize and discuss treatments and help answer the four questions they pose. It is noteworthy that all the reviewed techniques, only the triple tube technique and pancreas sparing duodenal resection, explicitly describe distal enteral feeding access. However, they would advise consideration of distal enteral access, ideally through a nasojejunal tube in all cases, as these patients are usually higher risk and have often not been optimized preoperatively due to the emergency nature of their procedure. So that completes a review, reviewing the paper, uh, Duodenal Ulcer Perforation, Systematic Literature Review, and Narrative Description of Surgical Techniques Used to Treat Large Duodenal Defects from uh, Clinch et al. Thank you for listening and watching Q Care Surgery Nerds, How to Manage Giant Duodenal Ulcer Perforation. I recommend you read the article yourself, make your own interpretations, uh, and thank you.